Hey, and welcome to Great Resources for Coaches today. Um, this is a, obviously a new format. You haven't seen me do, oh, I don't know if I'd say ever, but you probably haven't seen me do much. Certainly not uh, on this site and on, on this blog for Great Resources for Coaches. Those of you who follow uh, Proactive Coaching, um, are, and if you aren't, I highly recommend you start following Proactive Coaching at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash proactive coach, uh, you'll know that I've done a few video posts, but um, this is my first one for great resources for coaches, my own company. So uh, today what I want to do is um, I'm branching out. I'm going to try some new things here. And uh, what I'm doing is, is, as those of you who know, who follow, who've been following me for a while, uh, each week I, I produce a blog. I send out a blog post um, to your email inboxes. Those of you who are not getting the emails, um, those of you who haven't signed up for it, I I strongly recommend you get on on the site and um, and do that. You can click on greatresourceforcoaches.com and then click on the button up on the upper right where you can um, sign up to receive my my blogs each week, as well as uh, get a free copy of my ebook, Establishing Your Coaching Philosophy. Um, but anyway, this is a, a new format that I'm going to be uh, experimenting. Well, I don't even I don't even know if experimenting with will be the right would be the right term. I'm going to definitely want to start uh, start doing more videos. It's one of the things that I do uh, professionally, so to speak, is I'm a speaker with Proactive Coaching and I'm, I speak for uh, my own company, Great Resource for Coaches, and I've uh, been a teacher for you know, most of my life. So um, so I thought I'm, it's time to not only write my post, but I'm also going to start doing more uh, in a video format. So, um, so that's what today is. Today is kind of a, a jumping off point. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, one, it's been one of my goals and certainly for the start of 2018, I thought, here we go, let's do it. So, so today we're going to do something that's actually a little different than my other posts. By the way, you'll be able to um, get the post itself, uh, the written version of the post. I'm, I'm working out all the technology to try and get this video f uh, format um, posted, but also the written the written post. But today, I'm going to branch out a little bit. Normally, I talk specifically about you know, pretty much high school, middle school, youth types of sports. I'll branch into college occasionally. Today, I'm going to, going to do something that um, we're going to branch into the professional ranks, but as you'll see, it really deals with all of us. So so today's post is called LeVar Ball is Only the Beginning. Now, for those of you who have been living off the grid for the last year, you're probably not familiar with LeVar Ball. For those of you uh, who all, many of you probably know exactly who I'm talking about when I talk about LeVar Ball and the big baller brand. Uh, but he's the father of Lonzo Ball, and he's also the father of Leangelo and LaMelo Ball. Uh, Lonzo is probably the most famous of them. He plays for the Los, Los Angeles Lakers now. He's a rookie, uh, and he's doing pretty well. He's, you know, had his ups and downs like any rookie will. But um, uh, but Lonzo is is the one who kind of got uh, got all the hype, and um, and it all started with Dad Lavar, Leangelo and Lamelo. They've had their moments of hype as well, um, and Leangelo especially not for anything real positive. It was uh, an issue that he ran into when he was playing for UCLA at the start of this basketball season. He was a a, a freshman at UCLA and uh, got himself in a little trouble over in China as the team was um, was playing over there. So. So uh, the dad, LeVar, took Leangelo uh, out of school, out of UCLA, when they had suspended him for in indefinitely. And then uh, along with him, his 16-year-old son, LaMelo, who's a another great basketball player, but uh, took them both to Lithuania. And they are playing professional basketball in Lithuania right now. In fact, as of the day of this recording, last night, I guess they combined for 80 points in a 147, a 145-point game. Uh, but that's not the, 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 po the focus of today's post. Um, it's just a little bit of a background. I want to zero in on, on LeVar. And um, as I say, LeVar is only the beginning. And, and the hype that he has created, especially surrounding his oldest son, Lonzo. Now, as I said, Lonzo plays for the Lakers. And he's in his rookie year doing, you know, by all accounts or by most accounts, pretty darn good job. I know a lot of people felt he was going to be this great player um, who is going to score a lot. He's never necessarily been a great scorer. But what he is is he's a kid, a player who makes everybody on his team better. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's starting to change the culture um, around for, for the Lakers, which is great. It's what they need. Uh, basically, when he's played, the team's done well, and when he hasn't, they've kind of struggled. So, so he's he's been doing some good things for the team. 
Um, he isn't the problem. He isn't the issue. He isn't the focus of today. Uh, what I, I really want to focus on is the patriarch of the family, LeVar. Uh, LeVar kind of burst onto the scene oh, around this time last year, maybe, uh, maybe um, you know, more into the spring. But um, as, as Lonzo's season was coming to a close and his uh, younger boys' high school seasons were coming to a close, people started hearing a whole lot more about LeVar, the, the father. Uh, he's been compared to a lot of people um, as being like legendary boxing promoter Don King. Uh, it seems as, you know, the his mouth runs faster and runs more than any of his boys do when they play basketball is what a lot of people feel. Uh, he's quite bombastic and he's quite a self and family promoter. Um, arrogant, brash, cocky, those are comments you'll hear a lot of people say. And, they, you know, they, they say that those kind of comments from him, they don't just drip out of his mouth. They explode like volcanic eruptions, you know. And so some people may be saying, okay, what's the big deal? There have been a lot of arrogant parents and athletes and self-promoters talking about themselves through the years. Um, and so what's the big deal with that? You know, why is everyone so focused on this one? Um, well, I guess we could call it sport parenting gone wild. Um, while many people don't like bold, loud, arrogant predictions and comments like LeVar makes, uh, they're not the main focus of the attacks on him. Um, you know, he's spoken himself a bit in loud, boastful ways. If one's claiming he could beat Michael Jordan in a game of one-on-one. -on -one. Most people, though, they, they focus their ire and their attention on the fact that he seems to all be exploiting his sons. Whether that's true or not, that's how some people look at it. Uh, he attacks those who feel differently than him about his son's play. And then um, most recently, how he treats his son's coaches and their teammates. Uh, although even not most recently, back when his sons were playing in high school and in the AAU circuit, uh, he certainly had his you know, comments about his co their coaches. Uh, the most recent issue, though, is some comments that he made about Lonzo's coach for the Los Angeles Lakers, Luke Walton. Um, and so that's the issue I want to focus on. You know, sports parents uh, can be loud, overly aggressive, focused on their own child getting their way. That's nothing new. Anyone who's been involved in youth and school sports knows all too well that parents can be one of the biggest problems um, with te within team settings. You, you ask any coach in any level of youth and school coaching who's coached for a few years what their biggest problems are, very often they're going to come back with the word parents somewhere in their answer. And, um, you know, it's a shame we often hear about quality coaches who are, are resigning early in their career. Uh, and again, when you ask why, oftentimes it's because of parents, whether it's how the parents treated the coach or the parent expectations of how their kids should be handled or the expectations that they have of what the coach should be doing or running, you know, play, you know, what types of offenses, whatever the sport is, uh, things that they just don't like about the way the, the coach is doing things. So that's nothing new especially at our level, you know, the level that I've coached at for most of my life, um, the high school level and, and some middle school. We haven't seen that as much, though, at the next level, the college level. And we certainly haven't seen it very much at all at the professional level. Um, so so the, the level to which LeVar Ball has taken this, that's become the issue. And, and I don't mean the level of how much he's saying as much as just the sport level we're talking about. Um, and so, you know, it's one thing for, for coaches at the high school level to have to deal with parents. And, and, and you know, and, and so, like I, I mentioned before, uh, the, the younger boy, LaMelo, and his, old, and his the middle brother, Leangelo, dealing with when they were playing at the high school level last year. Uh, LeVar had issues with the high school coaches when they got knocked out of an end-of-season tournament. Um, and so he took those public, you know, and, and we as high school coaches, we take our share of that. And we understand that. It uh, doesn't mean we like it. doesn't mean necessarily we deserve to be treated that way, but it happens. However, the issue now with LeVar is he's being critical of Luke Walton and the Lakers. And it's like, uh, you know, okay, Luke Walton's a big boy. He's a professional. He can handle criticism. It's part of the territory. I'm not saying he shouldn't have to handle that. Not at all. What I'm saying, you know, I mean, here it is. He, he coaches one of the most storied franchises in all of sports. So, yeah, he's going to have to deal with his share of that. This, though, is different. You know, this is the parent of a player on a professional team, not just some random sports reporter or fan calling into a radio station. His child plays on that team. His, son's, his son has teammates 
with whom he's trying to build a relationship. He's trying to build team chemistry. He's trying to be a part of that and build that. Um, the coach is trying to build a relationship with his son, you know, and, and they're trying to maximize their chance for success. But so when you have a parent publicly popping off about his son's coach, it can have an effect on the relationship that that player has with his coach and with his teammates. Uh, you know, and it can have a negative effect no matter what level of play, whether we're talking about youth sports, middle school, high school, whatever, all the way up to the pros. It's just not that common at the professional level. Uh, as I said a minute ago, we've seen it a little bit in college, but not nearly as much in college either. And I think that this is, uh, here's what's happened. And here's why uh, the title of this is LeVar is, not, is, is only the beginning. Most overzealous sports parents mature in their ways as their kids mature as their kids grow and continue to play. So think about the youth sport parent who then their kid goes into middle school, then high school. Each step along the way, the kid is, a, is maturing. The experience is one that continues to um, be part of the, the parents' lives and the kids' lives. And so they kind of mature along the way as well. I know some of you are thinking, are you kidding me? Some of those varsity parents I deal with are as big a pain that, I, that I've ever dealt with. I understand that. What I'm saying is, is their child, though, is still under their roof. Their child is still a child. He might be a young man. She might be a young woman. But they're still children, especially to those of us parents uh, you know, who have them with us at those ages still. So, but then they step into college. And at the college level, that's where most parents start, start to cut the cord. Many of us cut the cord a lot sooner in terms of allowing them, releasing them to the game, as we say with proactive coaching. You know, it's an important stage and it's an important step. But for the most part, most parents buy their col the, the, the child's college ages, that's when they start to cut the cord. Some still struggle with it. And so you'll have your share of freshman parents struggling because this is the first time the child's away from home or whatever the, it might be. But their age, their distance from home, them growing up as well, them also saying, Mom, Dad, give me a break. I'm, I'm on my own now. You know, that helps to forge that new sport parent identity, I guess you could say. This, though, is a new frontier. Okay, we've entered a kind of a new frontier over the last decade or two. And, and LeVar, LeVar Ball and his children are kind of a prototype now. And, and it, for what I'm afraid will continue to be a more of a common occurrence. And, you know, some of you might be thinking, really? You think we're going to see more of this? I, I, I do. And here's why. I think LeVar Ball is a product of the environment of USA Basketball. I, I don't mean USA Basketball is the sport entity in capital letters, USA Basketball, that does a great job of trying to educate and help all kinds of um, you know basketball players and, and programs in youth basketball on up to become the best they can be. I, I'm not talking about that entity. I'm just talking about basketball in the United States. Okay, I think that the state of basketball that we're in, and other sports too, it's not, this is not just a basketball issue. We're just talking about the parent of a basketball player. Uh, I think they've, we've created a monster in many ways, or at least a new monster. And as with so many things in life, there's a trickle down element, you know, so things start at the top and work their way down professional, down to college, down to, down to, to, down to high school and so on. I think, though, this is going to kind of trickle up. OK, I think what you see is is a little bit of a different different situation. But here's how the trickle down has led to this, what I'm calling a trickle up. These NBA players nowadays make millions and millions of dollars, and they're superstars, and they're on TV, and, and they're little kids' heroes. That hasn't changed. That's been like that for many, many years. When I was a kid, my hero was Dr. J, and I wanted to be him. So that it's not that. It's that as the game has changed, the age and the person who the hero is now has changed. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. You have these a, a lot of young men you know, who are 19 years old, making millions of dollars playing. And a year before, they were playing on a high school or an AAU um, you know, kind of setting across the country. And so younger young men see that and go, oh, I'd like to get in on that. I'd like to be a part of that. And so they want to do whatever it is that led those kids to get to the NBA. And I, and I do mean kids. You know, so the best option for a, a, a young man to or young woman, obviously we're talking about young men right now because it's the NBA, but the best option is to play Division One, you know, a Division One sport. And again, we're talking about basketball for the purpose of this this post. Um, that's where the NBA gets the majority of its players. Division One college basketball. Although you've seen a, a trend recently of a lot more European players being um, being drafted. 
Um, so if, if, if I want to get to the NBA and get what those guys who are a year, two, three years older than I am are getting, I want to make sure I do the best thing I can to do that. And that's play Division One basketball. So the best way to become a Division One basketball player is to become a really good high school aged player. Um, well, the best way to do that is become a really good middle age, middle school aged player. And so, yeah, I mean, my gosh, we're hearing about the next great sixth, seventh, and eighth graders out there. It, it boggles my mind that we even, you know, say that and that we're that's the world that we live in. But it is. We're. I mean, this is a, a nationwide thing that we see now through ball is life and a variety of other things. My son is 17 and he's been following this type of stuff for years. By the way, you'll also notice that I didn't say high school or middle school players. I said high school aged and middle school aged. Okay, and that's because again the landscape has changed. You know, as I was growing up and over the you know up until the last 10 to 15 years, you know, it was always the most important experience that a, a high school kid had was his or her high school team that he or she played for. Nowadays, the focus is much more on AAU, select teams, elite teams, travel types of teams. Um, it, it, the, the most important games that kids play to be able to get seen, okay, and to have a chance to get to the next level are AAU games and, at tournaments. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily excited about this as a high school coach and a middle school coach myself, uh, but that's the way it is. These exposure teams and tournaments are the way that kids are getting seen now. Much easier. It's much easier for coaches to go to one tournament over a weekend and see a lot of kids than to go to individual high school games. And so things have changed. But what are these select teams You know that these kids are on? Well, basically, they're all-star teams of kids with a lot of talent. They come together to play in these tournaments okay, to be seen by coaches. They spend very little time together, uh, very little time with their coaches. They're not honing a lot of skills with those teams. They're not creating a team culture, learning about a team experience through this. And yet this is the experience to them that's going to get them to the next level. So most often these are teams where the players, they don't even know each other until they come together to play. Or they, don't, they do know each other from competing against each other in other places, sometimes when they do compete for their school. So I'm not saying kids don't compete for their schools anymore, but the school experience is not the same as it used to be. Um, and so, so this is the, this AAU and this tournament setting where it's almost like mercenaries, where kids are being you know recruited to go play on certain teams, and then they play all across the country or at various tournaments. Um, that becomes their mindset. This I, I'm a mercenary. So they travel a distance to meet with some people. They get together. They practice a few times, and boom, they go play multiple tournaments maybe playing four to five to six games in, an, in a weekend. It's hard to build any kind of a bond. Hard to get a lot of skill development that way. You know, you aren't seeing a ton of that. Not much chance for teaching and development life lessons and not much chance for intentional character building, which are all things that the you know, normal team experience provides for kids through the years. Nowadays, in those settings, it's all about winning games, getting seen by coaches, getting seen by scouts. Not necessarily in that order either. For the lucky few... Or those hard-working few might be a, even a better way to put it, but sometimes luck is going to enter it, who do get good enough to be drafted by top college programs, the goal now becomes, I want to get to the NBA. If these and if these players are really good, they might become what are now called one-and-dones. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, the one-and-done means they go to college for a year, and a lot of times not even a full year, uh, and then they get drafted into the NBA. That's the kind of the rule right now. You have to have you have to be at least um, of the age. You have to have gone to college or been through what would have been the age of one year of college before you can go into the NBA. That's a whole different topic, and whether or not that's going to change, you know, it's up for debate right now. But once again, those okay, one and doneers then okay, there's those who are really good in that group. Then they get drafted and they fulfill this dream they've had for so long. But when they get drafted nowadays, they're 18, 19 years old, okay? They're still babies in a lot of people's eyes, especially in their parents' eyes. And so that brings us back to the problems that, I've, that we started talking about earlier, the kind that LeVar Ball highlights for us. These 19-year-old kids, parents, they're still you know, treating the kid the way they've always treated them. They don't see their kids as adults yet for the most part, and they see them they're still strongly involved in their lives because they're still so involved in their lives. They haven't cut that cord yet. You know, they, they, so they, they kind of stick their noses into their kids' businesses a whole lot more, you know, and 
And that's the difference in the paradigm that we see nowadays. This is this is a realm where parents have ventured that uh, are, are venturing now that they haven't ventured before. You know, at least not in the loud, vocal, critical ways that we saw we've seen Lavar Ball do with his kid. Um, you know, because think about it. In the past, a kid would graduate from high school, go on to college to play. And they'd have three, four, five years in college sometimes where they're playing, developing, growing. And so when they finally, if they get really good and they finally do make it into the NBA, they're 22, 23, 24 years old. Much different type of person, much different type of player as a 23-year-old than a, an 18 or 19-year-old. And also, their maturity level has been also carried, has been also mimicked, if you will, uh, mirrored by their parents' maturity level. You know, I mean, they, the parents start to change how they approach watching their kids' games and being involved in their kids' games. Think of it this way, you know, uh, uh, some of the parents start to realize, okay, now my son or my daughter is playing at a level that it's kind of their job. Um, what parents walk into any employer? You know, imagine a kid, a non-athlete kid, getting you know graduating from college and then going in to work for Google or Amazon or Goldman Sachs, and here comes mom or dad to complain <laughs> to his or her boss because of some of the things that they're doing or the way they're running the job or whatever it might be, or they're being interviewed on TV or in the newspaper because they have a problem with the way that's being handled. It, I mean, it's laughable, and yet it's exactly what's happening with someone like Lavar Ball. And, I, and like I said, I don't think he's going to be alone for very long because that's the culture that we now have. The culture of 18 and 19-year-old babies who are going on and starting to play professionally. You know, so with this paradigm shift that we've seen now, um, LaVar is kind of paving the way and showing other parents that they can do this. Get ready to see more of them. I'm not excited about it, but... Get ready to see more overly involved parents at the college and professional levels. Um, you know, and as kids play and they, they make the most impact, you know, the ones who make the most impact keep getting younger and younger. Well, so too will their parents. So too will the maturity level, at least, of their parents be getting younger. And so if you have overly involved parents at the youth levels, school levels, and now those kids are making it on into the professional levels as very young, young people, um, we're going to keep seeing this happen, um, and we're going to keep we're going to keep finding that um, you know this is this is the new paradigm, the new way that we're going to see a lot of our professional sports. By the way, this isn't just a wake up call for the NBA. I mean, in the basketball world, no. I mean, get ready NFL, get ready NHL and Major League Baseball. Although I imagine NHL, the NHL and and Major League Baseball have probably been dealing with this in their own way for many years because you have minor league farm systems. I wonder also if, if soccer has dealt with this because of the academies that the kids go to and start playing. Um, and so you start seeing younger players uh, there. I'd be really interested to hear your takes on that, those of you who are involved in those types of sports. Um, but also get ready, all of you college sport people, whether you're NCAA 1, 2, 3, or NAI, or NG, you know, junior college, get people at all levels of sport need to get ready for it to be an even bigger issue with more and more parents and more and more athletes. You know, I often say so many of the, uh, of the problems we have in youth, school, you know, youth and school sports, like sportsmanship issues, the decline in numbers of officials and, and you know, kids, um, you know, not, us not mandating education for youth sports and things like that. I, I often say it's only going to get worse before it gets better. And that's really a shame, but that's truly how I feel because that's kind of what we've seen so often with so many of these problems. Well, the same holds true with this. I'm afraid that, you know, the LeVar Ball, um, you know, kind of situation has paved the way for this, and we're going to start to see it devolve. You know, uh, you know, if you think about it, possibly LeVar Ball in, in the not-too-distant future is either going to be kind of a distant memory, you know, because we've had so many more like him that we kind of forgot all about him, or it'll just be one of many names that come to mind when we think of overzealous sport parents, you know, so... I hope we can get a handle on this before it gets way too out of hand. So anyway, that's a, that's a little take I have on, on LeVar Ball. I don't have a problem with, well, I have a problem with some of the things he said, how he's treated certain people in that, but I, you know, I get it. He's a, 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 a sport parent who's extremely, um, you know, invested in his kids and that that's understandable, but 
he's taken the, the this overzealous sport parent that we've dealt with for so many years in youth and school sports. Whew, he's taken it to a whole new level by bringing it to, up to the professional ranks of the NBA. So thanks a lot for listening, uh, you know, watching and listening. And I, I hope you like the new format. Um, if you're, if you want to, you know, check out the, the actual reading, the, the actual post and read that, that'll, you know, you can see that in the, I guess we'll call it show notes. I'm still, like I said, I'm still learning the tech for this, but um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about starting to do some of these video posts. So um, thanks again. And um, yeah, leave a comment for what you thought and uh, let's, uh, let's get after it and, and see if we can't make our youth sports and our school sports better this week.